there, my name is Kathleen Turner and I'm a registered dietitian working here at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. Over the next few slides, we're going to chat a little bit about how to make heart healthy choices and how you can start to make changes to your eating patterns to start thinking about eating in a heart healthy way. So let's get started. When we're talking about heart healthy eating, we're, we're really thinking about how can the food choices that I make help to keep my heart healthy. And what we know is that when people make heart healthy food choices, we see improvements in things like your cholesterol, your triglycerides, your blood pressure, your blood sugars, can even help you to manage your weight as well as your waist circumference. It can also help you lower your chance of developing heart disease as well as lower your chance of having a heart attack. Now if you're watching this and thinking, well I already have heart disease, we also know that heart healthy eating can help to slow the progression of heart disease. And not only that, it can help to improve the health of your arteries. So there's lots of reasons to think about making heart healthy choices. So let's talk about what those heart healthy choices are. We're going to start out by talking about meal timing. So we're going to go right back to basics. And it sounds like a really simple thing, but it's not always so easy when you're at home thinking about making these choices. But what you want to aim to do is try and eat your breakfast within about an hour of waking up. So it doesn't mean that you wake up, your feet hit the floor, and you're already eating breakfast. What it means is that maybe you get up, you read your newspaper, and then you have breakfast. But ideally within that hour of first waking up. And it doesn't matter what time you get up, whether you're getting up at 6 in the morning or 8 in the morning. It's within that hour. And then after you've had breakfast, what you want to try and do is aim to be eating every 4 to 6 hours following that. So if you get up and you have breakfast at 8, you might have lunch at noon, supper at 5, a snack at 10, bed at 11. But it doesn't really matter what time those meals are so long as you're aiming to have that 4 to 6 gap. Now unfortunately in today's day and age, we don't always get to eat at exactly 4 to 6 hours time, time intervals. So if you know that you're going to be longer than four to six hours between meals, what you can think about is trying to plan a snack. You want to choose something that's going to fill you up and sort of tide you over to prevent you from getting ravenous before that next meal. So you might have something like two tablespoons of nuts and a quarter of a cup of dried fruit. You might choose a piece of toast and peanut butter. Maybe you would have a yogurt. There's lots of different options, but a little healthy snack is, is certainly something you want to consider when you're getting getting into long gaps between meals. When we're talking about vegetables and fruit, we have lots of evidence that tells us when people make or people aim to eat fruits and vegetables every day and they are able to include 7 to 10 servings, we see improvements in things like blood pressure, cholesterol, triglycerides, can help you to manage your weight. So just eating enough fruits and vegetables has a lot of heart healthy benefits. Canada's Food Guide recommends between 7 and 10 servings of fruits and vegetables in a day, depending on your age and your sex. And you really want to try and aim for that 7 servings of fruits and vegetables. Now a serving is not as, as big as you might think. A serving of vegetables is only about half a cup. And if you cup your hand, that's about half a cup. Serving of fruit is also half a cup. So if you're finding the idea of trying to eat seven to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables in a day a bit daunting, break it down. So what you're really thinking is, can I eat a fruit or a vegetable at every meal? And if you can do that, you're gonna be closer to that seven servings of fruits and vegetables. Now they don't have to be fresh, they can be frozen. That's a great alternative, a great option. You can keep it in your freezer and pull it out when you need it. So fresh or frozen is equally as good when it comes to nutrition. If you're going to eat canned fruits or vegetables, canned fruit is a, a really good option. You just want to pour off the juice that's in there. And if you choose to eat canned vegetables, what you want to think about is rinsing those vegetables with water really well. And by doing that, you get rid of about half the sodium. So the bottom line when it comes to fruits and vegetables is that you want to try and include one at every meal in an effort to get to that seven servings. All right, let's talk a little bit about fiber. Fiber has a number of health benefits and one of those benefits is that it can help to lower your LDL cholesterol and that's soluble fiber that can help to lower your LDL cholesterol. 
There are two types of fiber. There's soluble fiber and there's insoluble fiber. But you don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about whether you're including soluble or you're including insoluble fiber. Many foods, particularly fruits and vegetables, will actually have a combination of both soluble and insoluble fiber in them. So what you really want to be thinking about is food. So which foods do you want to choose more often? Well, part of getting to your your fiber recommendation is including your seven servings of fruits and vegetables in a day. And the other thing that you can do is to start to choose whole grain products. So things like brown rice or brown bread or whole wheat pasta, those choices are going to have more fiber in them than white bread or white pasta or white rice. And again, these changes can happen slowly. So you might try brown pasta and once you figure out that you like the brown pasta, maybe you'll try brown rice. But you want to be working towards making most of your choices whole grain choices. All right, let's talk about portion size. Now people will often say that this is the thing they find the most challenging. And you can look at this plate and think, wow, that looks pretty simple. But when you get home, when you're starting to think about what you're gonna eat, it can become more challenging. But this is something that's a really easy thing to think about when you sit down at your, at your table and you're starting to eat. What you really wanna try and think about is the portions of your starch and your protein. So you'll notice that the bottom left hand corner has starch in there. So that's things like your potatoes, your brown rice, your brown pasta, those types of food. And if you're sitting at home, you can actually make a fist. And that's about how much starch you wanna aim for in a meal. So it's not a lot, but it is certainly enough that you would feel satisfied. When we're talking about your protein, that's things like your fish, your lean meat, chicken, beans, lentils, those things that include protein. That should be the other quarter of your plate. Now, sitting at home, I want you to look at the palm of your hand. That's about how big that piece of meat you eat should be. Now, in terms of the thickness, you want that piece of meat to be about the thickness of your pinky finger. So now you've figured out, okay, well I wanna have about a fistful of starch and I wanna have about a palm of protein. What you wanna fill up on here is vegetables. So you wanna try and have at least two kinds of vegetables at your meal and it should really be about half your plate. Vegetables are very filling, they're low in calories, they also taste great. So that's what you wanna fill up on. So when you sit down to your meal, you think, okay, I'm gonna have a little bit of my, my potatoes or my rice or my pasta, I'm gonna have a little piece of, of meat or fish or chicken, and then I'm gonna have a lot of vegetables to go with that. You could also have a glass of milk and maybe you want a piece of fruit for dessert. But this is ideally what you want your plate to look like. Now if you're sitting there thinking, holy man, my plate doesn't look like that at all, that can come with time. You don't have to make changes to your eating overnight. You can start to make small goals. So maybe you might start out by decreasing your protein piece a little bit, or you might increase your vegetables a little bit. That's okay, things don't have to happen overnight. You can take your time to make these changes. When we're talking about fats, so fats in food have an impact on the cholesterol in your body. There's three main types of fats. There's unsaturated fats, saturated fats, and trans fats. And they all have different impacts on your cholesterol. So we're gonna start out with the good news and we're gonna talk about unsaturated fats. Unsaturated fats can help to lower your LDL cholesterol, which is your lousy cholesterol. When you choose these unsaturated fats over saturated fats. So where do you find unsaturated fats? Well, you find unsaturated fats in liquid oils and generally speaking those oils come from vegetables so it's things like canola oil, olive oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil. These kind of oils are, are full of unsaturated fats and these are what you want to be choosing at home. So if you're making a stir fry you can use um, canola oil instead of something like butter or lard and many of us have already made that change but it's always good to think about that on a regular basis. Other good sources of unsaturated fats are things like nuts and seeds, avocado, 
nut butters like peanut butter or almond butter. These are all things that you want to choose more often. Talking a little bit about these bad fats or saturated and trans fats. Now saturated fats come mainly from animal sources. So it's things like steak, um, red meat will have a lot of saturated fat in it. You also find saturated fat in chicken or pork tenderloin, but you find much less of it. So the big culprits in what we eat is typically red meat and dairy products. So what does this mean for you at home? This means that you want to try and include red meat only once or twice a week. The other nights of the week or at lunchtime, you want to choose things like fish, chicken, uh, lean cuts of pork, perhaps pork tenderloin, and, and you might even want to try and include a vegetarian meal. So something like a vegetarian chili or maybe making a stir fry with tofu. But again, you know, you don't have to be a vegetarian to be healthy. You just want to choose those, those red meats in moderation. Now when it comes to trans fats, we find trans fats mainly in processed foods. We're seeing less and less trans fats now, but it is important to be aware that they are still out there. So your best way to find out about trans fats is to look on a food label and aim to find something that has close to zero as possible because those trans fats have no redeeming features. They're going to make your LDL or your lousy cholesterol go up and your HDL or your happy cholesterol go down. So you really do want to try and limit those trans fats. So the bottom line when it comes to saturated and trans fats is you want to look at your food label and aim to find things with as close to zero as possible of trans fats. And for saturated fats, you want to limit your red meat to once or twice a week and try and choose some low fat dairy products. So 1% or skim milk, lower fat yogurts, and maybe even trying some low fat cheese. Salt. So we're going to talk a little bit about salt now. Salt is made up of sodium and chloride. The dangerous part of salt is the sodium and sodium increases your risk of developing high blood pressure and high blood pressure increases your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. In a day, we recommend that you have about 1500 to 2400 milligrams of sodium. A teaspoon of salt has 2300 milligrams of sodium in it. Now what we know is that most of the sodium that we're eating is actually coming from processed food. So it's not so much the salt that you might add in cooking or the salt that you might add at the table. It's really coming from the foods that you eat that you buy that are already made. So what you can do is you can actually read a food label to find out how much sodium is in there. So you're aiming to find something that has less than 10% daily value written on the food label for sodium. That's your target. Now salt is very much an acquired taste. So if you're used to eating a lot of salt, so you put salt in your cooking and you add salt at the table, if you all of a sudden go cold turkey and stop eating that salt, you're gonna notice a really big difference. You're gonna find your food tastes a little bit bland. So you can do it cold turkey and you will adapt to that flavor. If you, the other option is of course to do it gradually. So if normally you put a teaspoon of salt in your recipe, try three quarters of a teaspoon. Then you can do half a teaspoon, then maybe a quarter of a teaspoon, and you might be able to get rid of it all together. If you're salting food at the table, instead of salting your food, salt your hand. And then put the salt on your food from your hand and gradually cut back. As you use less salt, you get used to the flavor of things not having that salty taste and you'll start to really like that. So you may want to use other ways of spicing your food. So herbs and spices are a great way of giving things flavor. You may also want to use things like lemon juice or vinegar on your food. It gives your mouth a nice taste, but it doesn't have that salt in it. But feel free to use other spices as much as you want. Talk a little bit about alcohol. You should always check with your physician about alcohol, but generally speaking, alcohol is considered safe. We do recommend alcohol in moderation. Now moderation is always the key piece here. So what moderation means is it means one to two drinks per day, 
to a maximum of 14 drinks per week for men and nine drinks per week for women. So one mixed drink is considered about one and a half fluid ounces. So that would be something like, you know, vodka, gin, brandy, rum. A, a drink is considered one and a half ounces. When we're talking about wine, a drink is considered five ounces. And when we're talking about beer or wine coolers, a drink is considered 12 ounces. So this is a good thing to keep in mind if you choose to include alcohol in what you're eating and drinking. We're going to talk a little bit about how you can start to make changes to your eating patterns. When you're thinking about making changes to your eating patterns, these changes don't have to happen overnight. They can take time. So you want to start out small. Start out by picking a goal you're certain that you can succeed at. Once you've succeeded at that goal, you might want to set another goal for yourself. But these changes don't have to be overnight. You can take your time to make these changes. So that's all I have to say for the nutrition section. If you'd like more information, you can refer to your Healthy Living Guide. Thank you very much.